it's Reya and welcome to another video. Today I am finally going to be doing my February reading wrap up and I read a ton of comics and some books this month. So at first I'm going to be going over all of the books I read and then in the next part of the video um, I will talk about the comics and I will leave timestamps in the description if you want to jump around and see what I read. And without further ado, let's get cracking with my February reading wrap-up. The first book that I finished in February was Vita Nostra by Sergei and Marina Diachenko, and I made a full review of this book. I really enjoyed it. I will leave the review in the description and the cards, so you can check it out if you haven't seen it yet. But I thought that this book was really good. It was very sort of cerebral, um, like stream of consciousness. It talks about language and meaning and um, magic that is sort of like imbued in meaning and in editing the world around you and basically becoming the language itself in a way. And I thought that this had such marvelous concepts. It sort of reads like a Russian fairy tale in a sense, um, while also being incredibly modern and taking place in a contemporary setting. But this book also doesn't at any point tell you at which time it is set. Uh, so it kind of feels very timeless. It, it could take place in the 90s or like any time after basically the only thing that really grounds it to a certain time frame is cell phones but yeah i really enjoyed this book i gave it four stars the next book that i read was before the coffee gets cold by toshikazu kawakuji and this is a very short speculative fiction novel it was originally a stage play and you can really get the sense when you're reading this that it's a novelization of a stage play. It is very, like, um, heavy on the set design or, like, setting the stage element. Like, uh, the way the coffee shop is described and the lighting is described is very reminiscent of how how a play would set the stage for a particular scene. There's also like a lot of dialogue and such, and the characters themselves are very like... They represent certain tropes in Japanese media. You have the sort of quiet, reserved uh, teenaged girl. You have the brusque, uh, middle-aged, sort of beefy male figure, and then you have the frail, um, sickly um, mother figure, basically. And, and, like, if you have seen a lot of anime or read manga or been immersed in any sort of Japanese media or East Asian media, you will recognize these tropes instantly. So I, I would say that for people who maybe are not as familiar with, um, in this case, Japanese media, they wouldn't key in to the tropiness of the characters, because the characters feel very much like stereotypes. They are very much like something for the actors to play around with, rather than being um, like full-on developed characters. They are like kind of caricatures, basically. Um, it sounds like I'm ragging on this book a lot, but I'm actually not. I just thought that it was very interesting how much the play aspect of the story uh, comes through. I It made me really interested in seeing a stage version of this story. It is basically a time travel story where when people visit this cafe, uh, if they sit in a certain chair in the cafe, they can travel back in time. Uh, but they can't leave the cafe, they can't leave the chair, and they can only visit people who have been in the cafe. 
So what's the point of time traveling then? So so it deals with grief and closure and like how these people deal with uh, disappointments, rejections and things that they feel they had no control over in the past and how they while they cannot change the past, how they may want to change themselves as people. So I thought that it was very interesting on a conceptual level. The execution, on the other hand, was not my favorite. It was um, kind of repetitive. Um, the, as I said, the set design is uh, repeated over and over. Uh, with and the, and the ritual of the coffee making is repeated almost word to word with every single customer, so it's it's kind of repetitive and it gets a bit tedious at times. Also, uh, the story was very conservative, uh, and if you are not prepared for that type of very conservative patriarchal Japanese lens, you might feel uh, uh, like you might get upset by some of the things the characters are saying because they are not um, questioned and they are not um, addressed or challenged in any sort of meaningful way. This book very much plays into that sort of status quo of the traditional Japanese society. Um, but I still thought that it was an interesting read and I gave this three and a half stars. I then read The Test by Sylvain Nouvelle. Uh, this is a short story that's nominated in the short story, co uh, short story category in the Booktube SFF Awards, and I listened to this on audio. And I have to say that the audio performance of Neil Shaw, the audio narrator, really like elevated the story for me. The text itself it is not very surprising, and if you've ever watched a lot of, like, well, Black Mirror or other, like, Twilight Zone episodes or even, like, X-Files or stuff, the, the way the story is, stru is structured is, is not very challenging or surprising. It very much leans into uh, similar kinds of tropes and basically um, this this is a book all about the trolley pr problem. So um, it the text itself I feel like I would have given it maybe three and a half, four stars, but the narration really sold it for me and I there was a lot of emotion behind the like narration and the way uh, the narrator did the accents and the different voices for different people like the uh, like the main character and some of the women and the operators and stuff like that it, the narration was really good so i gave the audiobook specifically five stars because i was hooked i was thoroughly engaged. I I could not stop. Well, when I started, I just listened to it from start to finish on one sitting because I was that gripped by it. And I think that if I had just read it as a text, I wouldn't have had that same emotional pull. So I have to say that um, I'm basically giving five stars to Neil Shaw and three and a half and four or four stars to Sylvain Nouvelle, if that makes sense. So, um, yeah, <laughs> that's my thoughts on The Test by Sylvain Nouvelle. And the final book that I read in February was The Haunting of Tramcar 015 by P. Jelly Clark. I've been really starting to love P. Jelly Clark's work. He really knows how to build a world where you where you can see how that world works you can see the history behind the world you can you can see the culture and like how it affects people and and what 
like how people are living their lives in in subtle details like what food they're eating what sort of politics are happening what groups are thinking about politics in what way it 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 really like he really knows how to bring that sort of diverse humanity into his worlds and i love that i really feel like i can see a lot of different stories happening in this world and even though this um novella is set in the same universe as a previous short story that P. Jelly Clark wrote. This works perfectly as a standalone. The other story is subtly referenced a couple of times, but I haven't read it, and I didn't feel like not having read that story diminished my enjoyment in any kind of way. So I really enjoyed it. This is basically sort of a police pr- police procedural about these two paranormal detectives trying to figure out how to banish a, a, an evil spirit from a tram car. It's basic. It's exactly what it promises on the tin, and it's funny, and it's like it's engaging, and it deals with uh, a very historically interesting period, the late. Uh, late 19th century. I I really enjoyed it a lot. I will say that I wish that this was an actual novel. I I feel like some of the characters could have been fleshed out a little bit more. They could have been given a little bit more screen time if this was a novel. Right now this had so many characters packed into it that, that sometimes it felt like there was a little too much bread for a, a, for a little sliver of butter, if you know what I mean. It, it felt very thinned out. But still, I liked it a lot, and I gave it four stars, and would recommend it. Next, I want to briefly go over all of the comics that I read, and there was a lot, so I will try to keep my thoughts brief. Luckily, a lot of them were sequels, so, you know, that helps. Uh, the first one that I finished was the twelfth volume of The Promised Neverland. And I feel like right now this series is at the point where it will either make it or break it, you know. Um, there, In this volume there was a time skip, which I feel like could have been handled a bit better. I feel like if the time skip could have been like split between like two volumes, it would have fleshed out the characters a bit more and and made the pacing a bit less janky um than it than it than it was. Um and I'm always a little hesitant with manga when it comes to time time skips. I feel that they can be necessary. In this case, I'm not sure yet. Um, But at the same time, I know of so many manga where they completely busted themselves, uh, I'm looking at you, Naruto, uh, after having a huge time skip. So I'm hesitantly optimistic. I think the story is going in interesting directions and I can't wait uh, how it turns out, but I'm, 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 I'm a little bit scared <laughs> at at this point. Uh, I gave this volume three and a half stars, though. Then I started a new series called Isola, Volume One, by Brendan Fletcher and Carl Kirsch, and I really enjoyed this. Uh, first of all, the art is amazing. It has this very lush color palette, and the way the scenery and everything is drawn is really fun uh, and vibrant and there is this sort of primitive nature um to the designs of the characters in a sense i'm not talking like this feels like renaissance but also kind of stone age were put together like the way the armors and stuff are designed. It it feels like these people 
are living in this lush in in this lush uh, jungle uh, world where there are lots of dangerous animals. So every bit of garment and like clothing is very simplistic, but the armor is kind of um, inspired by sort of Italian Renaissance in in design. It it looks fantastic, and I never thought that I'd. I'd want to see that sort of aesthetic. Uh, I didn't know that I wanted it before I had it, you know. So, so the art style is amazing. The story itself, it kind of throws you in at the deep end. It doesn't tell you a lot. But I feel like you get all of the necessary information in the first volume about the story. Basically, you have this captain of the Queen's Guard who has to take her queen, who has been cursed, into a tiger. And she has to take her to Isola, the land of the dead, uh, to seek the spirit of the person who put the curse on her. And that's all I will say. Uh, there is some really interesting, like, uh, a few different indigenous cultures in this that I, that I feel like I want to know more of. There are, there are these, uh, there is this tribe of people who are communing with animals and they kind of are trying to reach a sort of in-between state between human and animal forms. And that is why they kind of worship uh, the queen, who is now a tiger but she is a human in a tiger's body. It's it's super weird and interesting, and I can't wait to read the next volume whenever I get my hands on it. I gave Isola Volume 1 four stars. And then I read Ascender Volume 1 by Jeff Lemire and Justin Nguyen. Uh, this is a sequel series to Descender, which I liked for the most part. But I have to say that I'm not as big of a fan of Ascender because I feel like uh, this first volume doesn't really do anything to really set up the world or the conflict. We don't really get to know in this first volume what made the world um, go in this direction. We know the catalyst for it, but we we don't really see the progression in any significant way. And another thing is that the it, it feels like this first volume relies on sort of cheap nostalgia for the characters who were in Descender instead of establishing new characters as major players. So so it feels a little bit cheap in that sense. The art is still pretty, like, good standard fare for Descender. Uh, I think uh, Dustin Wen does a really good job with the watercolors. But I ended up giving this three stars. I'm still wanting to see where the story goes, but I'm not too impressed as of right now. Then I read the first volume of Blackbird by Sam Humphreys and illustrated by Jen Bartell. And I have to say that I didn't really like it. It is very much style over substance. And I have to say that I even had problems with the art style, to be honest. So this takes, the story takes place in a world with where there are these cliques of people with magical powers, but they're not really explained how that magic works or where it came from and how it exists. And, and there are people who sort of post about it on forums and have this, like, the the world itself isn't consistent on consistent on whether these gangs are public knowledge or not, because there are people posting about them on forums and on the in the internet, and there seem to be a key part of like popular understanding, but the main character at the same time is really shocked um, that magic exists because she has been 
told that magic doesn't exist, but then if people are posting about it online and they know the gang names and style, how does this any of this make sense? And I I had a real big problem with the inner logic and consistency in the story. There's also like the interpersonal relationship of these characters are completely out of whack. Uh, everyone is telling that like every they keep telling each other that they love each other and they care about each other, but their actions don't really show that. Uh, in fact, they show the complete opposite. So story wise, I was like. Okay, I'm not gelling with this. So how is the art style? Well, here's the thing. Jen Bartel knows how to draw a good portrait and knows how to draw a good, like, character design. She she knows design and she knows portraiture and she knows uh, what, uh, what a cool cover looks like. But in terms of panel layout, motion, flow of the action, that's not her strong suit. So what ended up happening is that every time there's a two-page spread or a cover art, that it would be super detailed and lush and vibrant. But all in all, the action and the scenes depicting action felt very flat and... It, it seemed like the characters were just floating there because, like, uh, the way the panels were laid out didn't really support the action. And, yeah, that's, that's like, a huge uh, a trip up for me. So I ended up giving this uh, first volume two and a half stars, mainly for the art. I just did not care for it. And I don't plan on picking up the second volume. This This was... Uh, not my favorite. Then I read A Man and His Cat, Volume 1 by Umi Sakurai. I made a full review of this manga as well, so I will link it in the cards and in the description. And I loved it. I gave it five stars. It was pretty much the perfect amount of coziness and warmth and just adorableness that I needed at this time. It just... it made me cry, it, it made me laugh, it was everything. So if you want to know all of my thoughts uh, in their full length, uh, I will leave the uh, review down below. And finally I read volumes 3 and 4 of Oku, The Inner Chambers by Fumi Yoshinaga. And this is an alternative history, speculative fiction uh, story of how would the Tokugawa era Japan uh, been like, the Tokugawa shogunate era of Japan been like, if the male population of Japan had basically diminished to about one man to every five women. And how would society be different? And it's basically uh, these last three volumes, and three and four in particular, have been detailing the history of how the world came to be how it is. And especially these two volumes were uh, focusing more on the interpersonal relationship of, of the aristocracy. And I thought that it was interesting, but at the same time, at, at times, it was very wordy and very much um, tell and not showing. Uh, there, there, there were a lot of moments where there was like a huge block of text uh, on a black page with almost no visual keys as to what were happening. Uh, where Yoshinaga was basically just detailing stuff that was happening historically. And I felt that she could have used those moments to sort of show what was happening more. Um, I still really, uh, for the most part, enjoyed these volumes, and I like where the story is going. I kind of, I, I kind of like how 
dark some of the characters are. Like, even the main characters are doing very, like, questionable things. And and just because... Um, and I kind of like the idea that just because this era of Japan has um, female rulers in this timeline doesn't mean that they would necessarily be any more benevolent or merciful than the the male counterparts. And uh, yeah, I gave these volumes three and a half stars each. Uh, I, I think that they were very enjoyable and I'm looking forward to picking up the next ones. And there you have it. That was my whole February reading wrap up. Uh, there were there were a lot of things, a lot of things, and that is why I've been putting it off. I've been putting it off talking about these books ever since the start of February because uh, like ever since the start of March because I knew that there were a lot of things that I needed to cover. But I did it. I persevered. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider giving me a thumbs up and. If you made it this far in the video, please give me a star emoji in the comments below so that I know you were here. And yeah, I will see you in the next video very soon. Bye bye!